nice Torah portion, Yishlak, and he went, or he sent, excuse me, and he sent. So I have another Hebrew word for us tonight, other than Vayishlak, which is actually a statement, a sentence. And that word is Mahane. Mahane, which is found in last week's Torah portion, but I'm free to talk about that tonight. Pretty sure, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm relatively sure that Amadu did not speak about Mahaneum or Mahane. The word Mahane is camp, but it's not the typical Hebrew word for camp, Mahane. It is the word that, that's appropriate for a military camp, an encampment type thing, a military outfit type camp, Mahane. It's found in, la in last week's Torah portion, Mahaneum. So if Mahane is a military camp, what, what is Mahaneum? Plural, camps. Sometimes we say it, it's referring to two camps, and it's not. It's plural, camps. The idea of it being two camps actually comes from the same chapter that we see the word appear for the first time in chapter 32 of Genesis, in verse 10, where it talks about that Jacob divided his, his family into two camps. So there's an assumption that the two camps that he divided his family into were the reference of Mahaneum, but it's not, because Jacob saw this incredible phenomenon of, of God's angels, God's, God's messengers, and he referred to that site as Mahaneum, meaning the camps of God. He wasn't referring to his two camps. So Mahaneum, plural for camps, but not just any camp, military encampments, Mahaneum. So we're going to spend a little time talking about Mahaneum, the significance of that location and so on tonight. So three points of interest that I'm going to focus on tonight. Uh, and, and of course, I've been doing this for a while, and I, I really like the idea of focusing more than one point. It moves me along uh, at a good speed if I can just commit myself to focus on three points and not spend too much time belaboring one point. So three points of interest. The first point of interest has to do with the, 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 the word Mahaneum, the encampment uh, that... that Jacob experienced incredible encouragement at Mahaneum. And so we'll talk about that. So the first point of interest is Jacob's, Jacob, encouragement at God's camps. Camps, plural, Mahaneum. Second point of interest has to do with Jacob's deepest prayer. Tonight we're going to see Jacob cry out to God in a way that we've never seen him cry out to God before. What do we know about Jacob prior to this Torah portion? He was sort of a man in the flesh. He was strong in the flesh. Oh, what do I mean by that? We'll discuss that in a few moments. But in tonight's story portion, the second point of interest has to do with what we see in him, a transformation, where he begins to pray deeply. Third point of interest has to do with, with Jacob at the Jabbok, which is in tonight's story portion. In fact, everything that I'm looking at tonight or featuring tonight comes from chapter 32. The Torah portion is actually 32 verse 4 to 36 43. So this portion is so compact with good teachable material, but I'm only going to focus on chapter 32. So let's talk about the first point of interest, Jacob encouragement at God's camp. So he was greatly encouraged at Mahaneum. Like I said, this is actually from last week's Torah portion, but let's read it. In chapter 32, 1 to 2, let's read about what happened at Mahaneum. Now Jacob went on his way, excuse me, as Jacob went on his way, the angel of God met him. So who met him? God's angel, the messenger. Jacob said when he saw them, so not just one angel, but messengers, angels. So Jacob said when he saw them, this is God's camp. So he named the place Mahaneum. A couple of important points there. One, he named the spot. He called it Mahaneum. So no question there's an there's a Aramaic root to the, word, to the word, to the phrase Mahaneum. Yes, there is. So he named the site Mahaneum. Why? Because he recognized God's angels were there, his messengers were there. And he said, this is certainly God's Mahaneum, his camps. So it's a reference of 
encampments. So think about it. He saw God's angel army is what happened. He saw the encampments, the military encampments of God's angels. So many times when people talk about Mahaneum, they talk about the Lord of hosts. What is the reference pertaining to the Lord of hosts? The Lord of armies, right? So, and it's a good, it's a good connection to make that Mahaneum has to do with the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. But many camps. So there's a good reason why Jacob did not say, Mah use the plural form Mahane, he said Mahaneum, because he saw more than one camp. There might be something prophetic to this that we'll talk about here in a few moments. I think there is. So let's talk, let's talk some more about this incredible site called Mahaneum. That site that Jacob discovered, or, or well, he didn't discover it, God discovered it for him. That site that Jacob named Mahaneum and acknowledged that God's camp was there, camps were there, became a very important site throughout the subsequent history of Israel. We see that as a result of Jacob's acknowledgement of God's camp and what he testified and what he did by naming that site, that Mount Gilead, which is very close to Mahaneum, becomes a very important location in the Bible during the period of the kings, even during the period of the conquest, uh, before the period of the kings and the judges, Mahaneum, Mount Gilead, became a very important site. Who knows, does anyone here tonight know anything concerning Mahaneum, Gilead, concerning King David? Anyone? I'm going to tax you to get into your studies in Zemat. What is the significance of Gilead Mahaneum relative to King David. Well, this is where he went when Absalom pursued him to kill him. He went to Mount Gilead or Gilead, but he went specifically to Mahaneum. Why did he go to Mahaneum? Because that's where Jacob was helped. That's where the messengers, the angels of God's army, of the host of the Lord, met Jacob. And David now being pursued by Absalom, and, and this is no doubt the most difficult period in David's life. This is when many of his psalms were written, psalms reflecting incredible anxieties and stresses. This is when he wrote those psalms. This is when his own son turned against him. And you got to think about what that must be like. When your own son determines to usurp your authority and destroy you. Absalom wanted to kill him. Absalom chased him and pursued him all the way across the Jordan River and to Gilead. So King David is in a compromised place. And what does he do? He runs to Mahaneum. I want to propose to you that he ran to Mahaneum because he was pursuant of the camps of God. He wanted the encouragement that Jacob, his father, knew at Mahaneum. The accounts that we see in regards to this, it's found in 2 Samuel. It's also found in Kings as well. Illustrates that nothing happened for King David at Mahaneum. Nothing. He got to Mahaneum, and the men of Mahaneum recognized him and said, this is King David. And they gave him food, they gave him drink, they gave him bedding and everything else, and they took care of him. But nothing significant in terms of David's help happened at Mahaneum. So think about it. David decides he will go to Mahaneum. Now he went to Gilead. Gilead is the, the, the mountain that Mahaneum is close to. But he didn't go to Gilead to hide. He went to Mahaneum to gain strength, to be encouraged, as Jacob, his father, was encouraged. And nothing happened. What could we take away from this story? Anyone, what do you take away from that story? Whereas Jacob was tremendously helped, you know, the angel of the Lord, the Lord's host, his army was there to support Jacob and encourage him. What was Jacob about to face? Esau, 400 men. Jacob was about to face the most difficult night of his entire life. By the way, he fared well that night, and we'll see that here in a few moments. And so this site, Mahaneum, represents what? 
for Jacob, a place where God intervened, a place where God's messengers met him and encouraged him. He saw God's army and was greatly encouraged. David went there expecting the same experience, and he didn't have it. What can we sum up from this? There is no formula, right? David expected a, a, a similar experience, and nothing happened. In fact, if you read the account in 2 Kings, it, it's apparent that there was some folly as a result of David going to Mahanaim. Now, I've had experience in my own life where I had breakthroughs in regards to a certain location, I mean a physical location, and someone came along hearing my testimony and decided to go to that spot and attempt to do exactly what I did, and it did nothing but create folly. So I see the same pattern. Why? And, and to sum it up, I'll say this. When God does something amazing and profound, it doesn't mean that he's committed to do it again in the same way, in the same place. It's, it's our weak and fallen nature to return to that same occasion, to return to that same place with the expectation. When God is doing something new and he wants us to trust him in a new and fresh and a, and a, a relevant way and not hold on to something that had happened in the past. Sometimes we cling to past events, expecting God to repeat. And God is doing new and different things. And that's what he expects us to do. Our faith has to be relevant and current and based on the, on the hope and the assurance of God doing something new and profound. So this is what, this is what Mahanaim represents. Now Mahanaim is not just a site that King David went to looking for help. Other kings of Judah did the same thing. And again, to no avail. God never repeated the incredible thing that he did for Jacob at Mahanaim. So even though Mahanaim becomes an important site in the Bible, it's, 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 there's no significance to it other than God met Jacob at Mahanaim. Jacob named that location the camps of God, the military camps of God. So I will add to the takeaway when God does something profound and amazing, acknowledge it, store it away, and move on. Because God's able to do much more than what he has done in the past. All right, so that's Mahanaim. So, so let's move on. Second point of interest. Now, that was last week's story portion. Now, what we're going to talk about now is what happened at Mahanaim. How Jacob was greatly encouraged. And how he was bolstered. Uh, his faith... Was, 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 was expanded tremendously at Mahanaim. And in tonight's Torah portion, which is what we'll talk about right now, we will see for the first time that Jacob reaches out to God. He prays to God with the deepest of faith. Never before his experience at Mahanaim, what followed, never before do we see any dimension of real faith in Jacob. What, what happened with Jacob as he was forced to leave Isaac's home, after the situation with Esau, which we talked about a few weeks ago. What happened with, with Jacob as he was traveling to go to Padanaram? What did he experience? He experienced his, the, the ladder, Jacob's ladder, right? Now we know, and we talked about this, that Jacob's ladder is a symbolic picture. That dream he had was a symbolic picture, a reference to who Jesus is. Jesus is that connecting point between heaven and earth. Now, Jesus himself said this to Nathaniel on the Galilee, right? You know the story. Uh, Nathaniel uh, had a miracle. Well, he witnessed a miracle when Jesus said to him, uh, you know, I saw you when you were under the tree. And Nathaniel marveled at this, and Jesus said, basically he said, uh, this is marvelous to you, he said, what, what if you see the angels descending and ascending upon the Son of Man? A clear reference that he is that connection between heaven and earth. He is that ladder. So the ladder that Jacob saw in his dream is a prophetic picture of Messiah Jesus. And not just a prophetic picture of Jesus, but of his ministry. The ministry of Messiah Jesus is that ladder. The connecting point between heaven and earth. Does that ring a bell in you at all? 
Does that speak to you at all? What does it say to you? We are that ladder, the body of Christ. If we're functioning as he is, and we should, we are that connecting point between heaven and earth. Is that, is that straightforward? We are the body of Christ. As he is, so are we in this world. If an aspect of his ministry is to be that ladder, then why would we not be that ladder? Is it, is it reasonable for us to believe to be that ladder, that connecting point between heaven and earth. Now, I say us. I don't mean us as individuals. One of the things that we struggle with so incredibly profoundly is that we tend to see things as it relates to us as individuals only. And very rarely we see things as it relates to the congregation. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a struggle. It's real. I know it is. But we have to see this from the perspective of us as a congregation. We ought to believe that the ministry of Messiah Jesus, as it relates to that connection between heaven and earth, is in us. If he is here, then certainly that aspect of the ministry is here, right? So you are that connecting point, Fellowship Church, between heaven and earth. You are that ladder. The angels of God ascend and descend upon you. It's reasonable to believe that because it's true. That brings me to encouraging you concerning praise and worship. You're assembling. And how relevant that is. When you assemble and you believe to be the body of Christ and you yield yourselves to it, you are more clearly then the body of Christ. You're that ladder. You're not that ladder because I said so or because, you know, you can name your church, you can start a church. And say, you, and say that the name of the church is Jacob's Ladder. The first church of Jacob's Ladder. Doesn't mean that you are. It means that you have a vision. Acting on that vision and making that vision a reality is where it's at. So as we assemble, as, as we commit ourselves to this by faith, we have to believe this and act upon it. And we become that connecting point between heaven and earth. What would be the... Outcome, what would be the benefit of being that connecting point between heaven and earth? By the way, that ladder was also pointing to Yerushalayim, to Jerusalem. The city of the great king. The place where Yeshua Jesus, the great high priest, will minister from. So, that ladder was positioned in, in, in well, in Jacob's vision. He saw it at Beth El. He didn't see it in Jerusalem. Now, what did Jacob say when he saw the ladder? He said, this is the house of God, right? That's what he said. This is the house of God. This is a foretaste of Yerushalayim, where this ladder will forever be placed. So every time you assemble, you have the potential. In fact, you have the opportunity beyond the potential to be Jacob's ladder, a fortress of Jerusalem right here in this place. Isaiah talks about the waste places of Jerusalem, the outside places of Jerusalem, in other words. That's who you are. You are, you are an outside place of Jerusalem. When Jesus comes, he will collect all of these waste places of Jerusalem, and he'll bring them to that literal place where that actual, not actual, but that figurative ladder will forever be. Jerusalem is the connection point between heaven and earth. And that's why the word Jerusalem is plural. You know that. Yerushalayim. It's plural because of that ladder. If it's a ladder, you have two points of connection, don't you? That's what a ladder does. So Yerushalayim, plural, because of the ministry of Messiah, this ladder that the angels ascend and descend upon. This is what Jacob saw a second time as he approached the Yabok to enter into the land. He saw the camps, the military camps of the angel of the Lord or the captain of the Lord's host. So Jacob saw this, this incredible thing as he was leaving the land. And what did he do the next morning? He did a religious exercise, right? That's what he did. 
He, put a, he built a pillar. He put that stone that he used as a pillow. And, and that's a little bit amazing, right, that he used a stone as a pillow. Have you ever used a stone as a pillow? Did Jacob had, did he have a very hard head or something? No, of course not. They would take stones and they would pad them with ram skins or something like a pillow and they would sleep on it. But he took that stone and he used it as the base of a pillar and he built a pillar. What did he do with the pillar? He did libations. He poured oil on it, he did a prayer, and he did a religious thing. That's what Jacob did as he was leaving the land. Very little faith, very little depth of, of, of spirituality. On the way back, he is ready for in-depth spirituality. He's ready to believe God on a completely new level, and this is when God reveals his camps to him. And he's greatly encouraged, because that's exactly what we see. Following his, his vision, his, the vision of the angels at Mahanaim, he gets an evil report. What was the evil report? We find it in verses 3 to 5, that Esau is coming from Mount Seir, which is way south in the region of Moab, and Jake, uh, Esau is coming with 400 men, a welcoming committee, right? With spears and arrows and swords and so on. So Jacob gr was greatly moved and troubled by this. And what happened? Well, Jacob turned to God. For the first time, we see him actually turning to God with an earnest, fervent prayer. And let's read that prayer. In chapter 32, 9 to 11. So Jacob said, O, o God of my father Abraham and, and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. So this is something that we see many times when men in the Bible, men of God, would turn to God earnestly and begin to pray. They would begin by reminding God of a promise. We see it a few times, actually. We see it with King Jehoshaphat. When King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, found himself surrounded by an insurmountable foe, force. And what did he do? He began to cry out to God earnestly, and the first thing he began to do is to remind God of his promises. Here we see Jacob doing the same thing. So when you turn to God and you, you're in fervent prayer, remind him of his promises towards you. Does he need reminding? No. You need the faith that comes from speaking out his promises. You, you follow me? You need the emunah, the, 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 the jolt of faith that comes from reminding him of his promises towards you. And that's how Jacob begins his prayer. Then he goes on. What I want you to see here is that Jacob is very humble in this prayer. Whereas before, what did he say to God? God, if you take me into Padanaram, and you give me clothes, food, and housing, then you'll be my God. That's what he says to God. Not much humility there, not much wisdom, not much humility, not much faith in Jacob as he left. But now he's on his way back, and he's wise. He's reminding God of his promises, but he's also humble. And here's, here's how we pray. I am unworthy of all the love and kindness and of all the faithfulness which you have shown your servant. For with my staff only I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two companies. Remember, he divided up his clan, his tribes, into two companies, thinking that perhaps this is what he would have to do to defend them from Esau. So he's making a simple declaration to God, you help me. I left here with nothing but a staff. And I'm returning with two companies. This is what you've done. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he will come and attack, attack me and the mothers with the children. For you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. So a wonderful prayer. It's honest. It's intelligent. It gets right to the, to the promises of God. He reminds God of the promises that were made to Abraham and Isaac and how God furthered the covenant with him 
tremendous prayer and with that humility. This is the very first time we see any of this in Jacob. This is a prelude to what Jacob would experience that very night. And what did Jacob experience that very night? He struggled with the Lord, yes, he overcame, and he became, he became Israel. Why? Because he struggled with God and overcame. So, but what else happened? It's very important. He came to the end of himself. His prayer, his experience at Mahaniam, that led to his fervent prayer. Again, he saw God's power manifest in his camps at Mahaniam, and he said, God is for me. The angels, God's army, they're here. Jacob is coming, but God is here to support me. And he cries out. Having been bolstered in his feet, he cries out to God. And this is building his faith. It's building his faith to the momentum, to the, in a momentum to where he would ultimately surrender himself. And that's what happens at the Jabbok, or just before the Jabbok. The name of the place is Peni, Peniel. So this happened at the Jabbok, at the, at, the, at the crossing of the Jabbok. After the Jabbok, what happened? From the Jabbok, if you're going towards the land of Israel, from the Jabbok, the Jabbok is a, a river, more or less, what do you encounter? The Jordan. The Jabbok goes into the Jordan. So the Jabbok is where Jacob struggled with God, overcame, but he really overcame himself. You see, that struggle with God was really about his own struggle with his own self, because I promise you, Jacob's struggle that night had to do with his desire to turn around and flee. Get out of there. Don't hang around. Take, take one of the camps. Take one of the, the groups and, and flee. His struggle was to get away. But he stayed and he, he fought and he overcame. He overcame himself that night. There's a psychology there that we need to think about. Have you ever been in such a place where you had a monumental battle and the devil said to you, you just have to run. You're not going to be able to overcome this. Why even try? Have you heard that before? But then the Holy Spirit is almost always there saying, no, fight. Fight. Plant your feet. Do not run. Have you ever had that? Yes. You've heard my testimony. I fought a battle just like it. And I overcame. I was changed radically following that night. The same thing happened with Yaakov, but much more profoundly than with me. Because this changed his life to the extent that you can see a new Jacob. Jacob was born again, folks. He was completely, in, in Christian terminology, he was completely born again, transformed. After this incredible encounter, all of it began when God spoke to him when he was in Padanaram. God spoke to him and said, return. And he did. And then he finds himself in peril. He reminds God that you told me to return. And then he, he says to God, I don't deserve any of this. You've blessed me so much. Now keep me in the midst of all of this. In other words, you took me out. You brought me back. This is all you. And I am now convinced that you will keep me because you've brought me to this place. You didn't bring me here to abandon me. In other words, and God reacts. How does God react? He begins to, to hold him and jostle with him so that he would not flee and that he would overcome. And he did overcome. And the very one who struggled with him, who we believe is Jesus, said to him, you've struggled with God and man and you've overcome. Your name shall be Israel, a prince with God. Jacob was forever changed. He was born again. Jacob, Jacob's faith from that moment becomes pure. In the land of Israel, we see nothing in Jacob that says that he did not have absolute faith. He had the faith of his father, Isaac. He had the faith of his father, his father, Abraham. 
We see that once he made it into the land, he knew that his children had idols, idols with them, right? They had idols, and his wives probably had idols hid with them as well, Rachel. And what happens? He forbid them to go any further with the idols. See, this, this is Jacob now, the man of faith, the one who is completely transformed. Now, the last point of interest has to do with a very important allegorical picture. You guys know that whenever I teach, I recognize and I am more than willing to talk to you about allegorical pictures. Why? Are these things that I invent? These, these views that, that are so clear in the Bible that I often point out to you, do I come up with these things on my own or is, am I the first person to recognize these allegorical views? No, of course not. These views, these, these symbolisms have been placed into the Torah by God himself. God framed the Torah to reflect these allegorical views concerning things that were way in the future from that point in time when the stories were told and recorded and became the Bible. In other words, God had very important things to say and he said them in hidden ways that only later generations can possibly understand. And that's what these allegorical views are all about. Tonight's, tonight's symbolism or allegorical view is incredibly profound. It is the most profound allegorical view as it relates to where the nation of Israel is today. This allegorical view would, would have not been relevant 100 years ago, not as relevant as it is now. It would have not been recognizable a hundred years ago, as it is now. You follow me? So these allegorical pictures that we have, and most of them, in fact, are in the Torah, also in the Tanakh, but in the Torah, these allegorical views, they develop as time goes along, as God brings about his final end, as he moves closer to redemption, these allegorical views become more relevant and more visible. Tonight's view is very, very much that way. It has to do with where Israel as a nation is today. I want to say to you that Israel today is exactly at the Yabok, or approaching it. Just as their father Jacob came from Mahanim and met God at Peniel at the Yabok, before he crossed over into the land of Israel and became Israel, Israel is there today. The nation of Israel is there today. I would say that the nation of Israel is at Mahanim, experiencing God's camps. Now, why would I say that? Why would I, in this analogous picture, why would I make that statement that Israel is beginning to recognize the camps of God and to be encouraged by the messengers of these camps? You see where I'm going. You should see it very clearly. Every body of believers, every church that commits itself to be a voice of encouragement to Israel, you are Mahanim. Every church. And it's not just Fellowship Church or the other church over there that has a good relationship with the people of Israel that, that manages to encourage Israel. Every church of believers, every ecclesia that sits under this sun has the opportunity to be one of God's camps, one of his encampments. And it's a reference to a military camp. You are, in effect, a military camp. Can you see that? Are we engaged in some sort of a military campaign? Not one of this world, but we are, in fact, engaged in a military struggle. In the spirit realm, we certainly are. We have to acknowledge this because if we don't, we will not fare well in this battle. Folks, I got to tell you, the struggle to be that connection point between heaven and earth, to be that ladder, is real. Every time we come together, there are factors, demonic factors, that are working to silence you that's been working to silence you all week, discourage you from standing in God's presence, deter you from surrendering in worship, 
Your fight, your battle is to press on and press through and become Jacob's ladder. Become that connecting point between heaven and earth. And it's an ongoing fight. Your struggle also has to do with you dying to yourself. This self-orientation is strong in worship. We want to be heard. Or we want to manifest. That's a position that doesn't fare well. If you're in a platoon and there's a battle, there's a war that rages, and you have a function in this campaign, If you're selfish in the battle, what happens? You hurt people. You endanger the life of others and your own. And you're not effective at all in the battle. A platoon functions as one. Whenever whenever you think of a... uh, Who saw the movie Platoon? Right, so we remember that movie. What happened to, to, to individuals in that platoon that was sort of centered on themselves? They were the first to go. They were the least functional, the least effective. The ones who had the better good of the platoon in mind and truly worked towards it, well, they were effective. That's how it works, folks. So there's a battle. This is a battleground right here. This is Mahaniam, one of the camps of God. And there are many. And our fervent prayer should be, God, raise up many such camps that in this day would stand and be a strong support to Israel and encourage Israel with your words, with your heart, with your love for them. Now, why is that relevant today and had not been relevant in the last 500 years? Because Israel was not at the Yabok. She was all, he was off in Padanaram. God has brought them back, and he has brought them to that crossover point where they will cross the Jabbok, cross the Jordan, and enter into the land. This is the time for Mahaniam. It couldn't happen 100 years ago. It couldn't happen 500 years ago. It's now. This is that time. And that's why this allegorical picture is so relevant, so timely. Because every church, including New Fellowship Church, should you endure and overcome in this battle, you will be that camp that will speak encouragement to Jacob, that would say to him, yes, Esau is coming after you, but God is with you. Is Esau, or the spirit of Esau, Edom, Esau is Edom, is Edom coming after Israel today, folks? You tell me. Who is Edom? Edom is Amalek. Uh, Let's be clear. Esau became known as Edom. The people of Edom are the people of Amalek. We know that God's perpetual enemy until the end of all generations is in fact Amalek. God said, I will make war with Amalek from generation to generation. Why? Because Amalek put his hands on the throne of God, challenge God's authority. This is Amalek, this is Edom, this is Esau. Is Amalek in the world today opposing the people of Israel? Yes, and guess what, folks? Amalek is also opposing you. Yes, Amalek is opposing you. Amalek is rampant in this world. Amalek even infiltrate congregations of people. Amalek is a spirit, not a physical demographic. It's a spiritual demographic, and that spirit is everywhere, working to undermine what God is doing, particularly what God is doing with the people of Israel. This is the struggle, and this is why you are a military camp, folks. Think think of yourself that way. You you know, I, I was thinking about this while we were worshiping I think sometimes we feel like, oh, it's Friday night and I want to show up at church because that's what's expected of me. So I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go through this, this, this routine. Oh, ho, hum. Oh, here I come. Uh, let's do this and get over with it. Ah, I'm going to do it again Sunday morning. Oh, this is becoming a burden. I think sometimes we feel that way. 
No. This is an ordained engagement. Ordained by whom? Ordained by God. That every time we come together, that ladder, Jacob's ladder, is in the midst of us and there's a connection point between heaven and earth. And the angels are ascending and descending upon it. This is our station. This is our appointment. We have to be faithful to it. So that at some point in the future, and it's coming, God will position you to more fully and carefully function as Mahaniam. Could you see it? That you, maybe a delegation of you, maybe it will happen next year or the year after, but at some point you will stand in the land of Israel and you will speak God's words to Israel and they will believe you and be encouraged that God will defend them from Edom, from Amalek, from Esau. What comes after that? Israel will cry out to God as Jacob did. Earnestly, wisely, in, in spirit, they will cry out. What comes after this? They will be transformed. God will put his Holy Spirit within the entire nation of Israel. Am I just saying that because it sounds good? Does the Bible tell us this? Absolutely. Ezekiel chapter 36. God is going to bring his people home. He will prepare the land for their coming. He will bring them home, and then he will put his Holy Spirit within the entire nation of Israel. And it says that they will be his people. He will be their God, and they will all obey him. This is Israel born again. The entire nation. You have a part in that. You are Mahaniam. You are called by God to station yourself and be that encouragement to the people of Israel, folks. I think sometimes we sell ourselves short. We do. We, 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 we have pains. You know, we're tired and, oh man, I'm getting old here. I can't do this much longer. Oy. And you're selling yourselves short. No, we need to energize, folks. We need to energize. It needs to reflect every time we come together because we are a military encampment. Our time to be that encouragement to Israel is coming. There will be many more like us. That's why it, it's Mahaniam. And it's not two camps. It's plural, period. Military camps. Mahane, Iam. Military camps. I can see hundreds of them on the mountains of Israel. Hundreds of them positioned to encourage Israel, to be the people that God has called them to be. And to stand and believe that God will protect you from Amalek. And what comes next, Israel? God will transform you. He will put his Holy Spirit within you. And you will cross over the Jabbok. And you will cross over the, 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 the Jordan, the Yadan. But you will see him face to face. This is the story of Jacob. Israel is being prepared by God to come face to face with him. And cross the Yadan. And enter into the land of Israel and be Israel. Why is this all about Israel? Because it's all about Israel. The redemption of the nations, folks, will not happen without the redemption of Israel. And that's why Israel is so important. Many people hear me and they say, Whoa, what is this about Israel over and over and over? Oh, Israel, Israel. What are you, a racist? <laughs> What are you, a, a Jew stooge? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not partial to Jews. I'm partial to Israel. I'm partial to the people of God who happen to be Jews, but those who call upon the name of God and believe him. Jacob at the Jabbok. He's at the Jabbok, folks, and he's waiting for you. He's waiting for you to show up. And many more like you, that will be that strong encouragement to him. And he will believe. When he believes, he'll cross over. He'll cross over. And he will be Israel. So that's the message. That's tonight's Torah portion. Allegorical, allegorical views are vital, folks. 
They are hidden, hidden stories that God himself took and tucked them away into the Bible, into the Torah. The Torah has more allegorical pictures than the rest of the Bible. I want you to absorb that. The first five books of the Bible, the Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy, has more allegorical pictures than the entire Bible. And the ones in the Torah are profound. This one is profound because it's so relevant. It is so who we are. It is, so, it is so who Israel is. When we go there, folks, and we speak encouragement to them, we're functioning as that ladder between heaven and earth. And they are amazed by it because they're seeing that ladder. They don't know exactly what they're seeing, but they're seeing it. And you speak, you speak to them the words of God, and they are lifted up. Every time we do it, we're bringing them closer and closer to the Yabak, to the Yadan. We're doing it. We're going to go there in a couple months. This is not a vacation. This is a military campaign. This is, this is a military excursion, folks. We've been preparing for it. This is boot camp. We've been preparing for it. When we set our feet on the mountains of Israel, that's when we're on a campaign. We're in the field. God's going to be with us. But he wants us to be Mahaniam. He wants us to be his messengers, Melakim, his angels. Could we believe such a thing? I'm selling you high, folks. But it's a good sale. Don't sell yourself low. Don't sell yourself short. You are a good sale. Sell yourselves high. Because that's who you are. Shabbat Shalom.